Welcome back to Division One Rejects, so episode 167 on the night of June 24th. Here we've got uh, no crazy guests joining me tonight. Just good old fashioned football storylines, and by old fashioned, I mean off season. You know what that comes with. But we got some good stuff tonight, regardless. Um, Cade joins me here shortly back in the studio to break down some new uniforms for a pretty top squad, top caliber playoff squad in Division II football down in Texas. And we've got a team on the NAIA side of things over in Iowa to just release some some sweet new uniforms. So we'll react to both those. Cade gives his like his little funny like out of ten rankings and, and some of those things, which are which are always appreciated. We've got a new Division Three scheduling agreement between their two different conferences, which is big time. How about uh, the NAI Player of the Year? We talked about him last episode, Jalen Gramstad. He makes the move to the Big Ten official, moving over to Nebraska. Big Red, uh, one from one Big Red to another. Some might say from Northwestern College to uh, Nebraska. That's an interesting move. We'll talk about that just a little bit more. I know we touched on it last week, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it. And then finally, to close it off, just to highlight another D2 team here, we've got a squad today that we're going to talk about. They won the Natty after only four seasons of football at their university. That, for like for people who watch and like know D2 football in recent history, you should know exactly what I'm talking about. But... Who knows? We'll save that one for kind of the end. Uh, appreciate you all tuning in. As always, watch this on YouTube. Hello. Don't forget the timestamps, video chapters, bottom of the screen there. If you're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever else, all those are in the description. Fast forward any part of the episode you want to listen to. Follow us on the socials. Hit us up. And uh, you saw our announcement. If you want your film or you want your stats put on the show, you can do that now. We've got a little document. It's uh, in the link in our bio. Check that out, and we can uh, we can help you connect you with some coaches and a lot of people who follow this show. And I'm just trying to be a, a way, one, obviously for, for me to monetize this show and, and get some worth out of it, but also for you guys, I think it actually is, I, I genuinely believe it's a good deal for you guys. I think it's I think it's something that could benefit you. Um, if, if it wasn't, and if I didn't believe that, I wouldn't do it. So excited about that, starting that off. Hopefully we'll have some guys here in the next couple of weeks that uh, take advantage of that opportunity. But uh, let's go cut over to the episode, or cut over to that portion, excuse me, that I filmed with Cade earlier today. <laughs> We got two new sets, I guess, sets of uniforms here to look at tonight. Um, Kate, joining me back. Love the shirt, by the way. Thank you. Appreciate it. Very clean. Yep. Uh, the first <clears throat> look, we got actually three different looks from this squad. Division two squad down in Texas. We talked about them on last week's episode. They have the youngest coordinator in college football. Yeah, I saw. I, I watched that, actually. Pretty sweet stuff down there at UTPB. Check out these unis. This is the first of the three combos to take a look at the Whites which are just so clean. Get the Lone Star uh, Conference Championship Trophy helps, right? That makes it look pretty. Sweet. Yeah, uh, I think first, first, first glance is giving off Denver Broncos. Really? Yeah. Just cause I'm, if I'm not wrong, I think the Broncos got New Jersey this year too. Yeah. And because everyone was mad they didn't go throwback, right? Yeah, and everything's just so modernized; like it's all the same. <laughs> that is kind of the the biggest critique. I think the biggest example, the greatest example of that is TCU. Yeah, they even got rid of like the horned like uh, well, collars they, they and wore all that like stuff. A, they wore like a a green. They were like green in basketball this year. <clears throat> TCU was. Yeah, are you serious? I gotta pull it up because TCU their football uniforms sucked. Yeah, then you yeah. look at a team like they have cool. They used to have cool ass unis too. Those black with the with mm-hmm. the good. Uh, that's horns. what I'm talking about. Those yeah. coll- the collars like that's that's what those were really sweet. And then there were a couple. There were a couple other schools too. I think Baylor. You look at Baylor. I think is a great example. Baylor's uniforms might be the most plain uniforms in college yeah, football. They got, they got a cool, uh, they got a cool like color combo too. Like they could be so good. They could, but the thing is, like everything's going so minimal and like I guess modern is the word, but like minimalistic is kind of the the thing. Maybe but looking at TCU. these uniforms, these are nice because I think they still have some good <clears throat> character to them. Yeah, actually, I was thinking Denver, but. In my head, I was really saying Bowling Green. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. I can see the Bowling Green for sure. I like this. I like the metal yeah, kind of great around the numbers. Yeah, it's like Eastern. It's like EMU's yeah, yeah. logo. Because this, like, this is like a good blend of like you have the minimal, the modern shit, but it's also the like there's a little bit of character, yeah. a little bit of I, th- I like them a lot. I think they're, it's really hard to mess up a white jersey though. It also is, especially with orange, I feel like it's kind of a layup, but also a, a cool... I guess part of it, look at the helmet stripe. Yeah, that's it, The cool. black on the sides tapers into the orange. Yeah, that's nice. I actually can't say I've seen that before. Yeah, that's definitely like details that, that people just weren't doing, you know, 10, <clears throat> even five years ago. I would say probably. definitely not even five years ago. I got to find that shit. That is sick. That's a sweet shot right there. Those gloves are sweet. Yeah, that's that, sweet. that matches pretty well. So that's the first look. Take a look at these, Cade. The black helmet with the orange uni. Same, so you'll notice the same details on the helmet stripe, though. 
right? The, those whites kind of taper. Yeah, those, I like these a lot. Those are cool. Love that logo front and center on the back. This is even a little more like a minimal jersey, but you still have the stripes on the shoulders. And I like, look on the pants, you see the basin yeah, down cool. the pant leg. Reminds me of uh, Louisiana, the Cajuns. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like Raging Cajun on the side of their pants. Oh, that is cool. I like yeah, I'm just rattling off different teams that it reminds me of. Like, yeah. it's not... But it's their own. They made. Like, I think they, that's what you always they do. They took that. Though. Yeah. Like they, who do they who do they remind you of or like who do they? They took that though and they kind of put their own. You know, they put their own deal on it. Put their own spin on it. Um. But these are. I, I really like these. There's a couple more here. There's your like shoulder stripe. Super minimal, but like ads. yeah, that's really Broncos, bro. Yeah, that is that one right there is. And that's these are Broncos. Adidas unis. I don't know the other one. I don't know the other set might not be, but that's that's a little more plain. It also is worth noting though, like good photography makes any jersey look good. Right? For sure, Like, these are just good photos, and I don't think that can be overstated and that, like, that makes these look just so much better. I Um, mean, I guess uh, it's pretty similar, dude. Talking what? Broncos? Yeah. But, I mean, I don't know. Yeah. It's, like, it's really similar. These are the last couple looks that they posted a lot. Yeah, these are definitely cool. I like them a lot, for sure. Yep. There's your simple kind of arm deal. Same deal on the back, but the orange on orange. Yeah, the black, I mean, the black helmets are are super sweet. So, big fan of those. Um, they got a lot yeah, going on down cool. there. They're going to, they're poised to have another big year. They do lose some pieces, uh, Hershner being being one of those guys. But we'll flip over to a team that you are quite familiar with, in St. Ambrose, and oh, the yeah. uniforms that, uh, that they brought out. And I want to talk about these because uh, another kind of unique piece on these, what jumped out right away, one, yeah, the baby blue is sick. How about the honeycomb stripe down the front yeah. of the helmet? I don't know how I feel about it. It's it's very unique and it's cool, but I don't I don't know I was I was a little torn. I that, love that was, the baby blue though. Yeah, like it's like uh, like it's so UNC. But I mean that's where your mind goes I think, to immediately. I think yeah. that the stripe is dope. I love the stripe. I also think and again this could just be lighting photography whatever. I think their blue is different. Yeah. Right. Like 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 definitely different. It's like a lighter baby blue. It is. It's not quite as I don't know. I almost in went your to face. St. Ambrose. That's what I was saying. That's why I mentioned. I that actually before. love it. I actually loved it there. Yeah. I thought it was a great place. Mm-hmm. I, could, the, uh, I could be rocking a baby blue fighting bees jersey right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Those are sweet though. Like They're I mean, very good. They've got a lot of attention too on Twitter and shit. So like, it's not like like people. A lot of people. A lot mm-hmm. of people posted these. A good ball over there. The blue visor too with that. They got like a, like a tent on that. Right? Yeah, that's cool. Which probably Sick. that can't be allowed, right? No, definitely not. No. <laughs> those are uh, those are sweet. Those are a couple more. I got more pictures. Like for the you. month of August, it's allowed because there's no <laughs> yeah. games. And then exactly that's that's pretty sweet. Yeah, those are those are clean. I yeah. like those a lot. So he's okay. Now we go to the fact that like we do these jersey shoots. There is no way you could get away with wearing this in a game. He's wearing glorified like, bro, people long do, underwear, dude. I promise they do in a game. Yes, he doesn't even have thigh pads or anything of the sort, bro. I promise you. There's I, no way. I, I've seen it with my own two eyes, dude. Like, don't get me wrong. I, I know there's a ton of guys that get away with the no knee pads thing. That's yeah. is what it is. Your own choice, right? But most guys at least have like the girdle with the thigh pads inset underneath, right? Bro, it's all it's all receivers and DBs. Like, I mean, a lot of uh, I'll probably say like half the receivers I lined up against last year did not have obviously didn't have any knee pads, and that's probably like seventy five percent of them. Yeah. But fifty percent of them didn't have any pads whatsoever. Bro, that's crazy to me. I don't like like. And the, if there again, was, it was literally like a circle like this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just so you could see it, like a pad because it was technically there. Yeah. Because they probably got harped on it before. And no, every year, bro. Every year they say like, the refs will come in and like talk to us before the season starts. Like, hey, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna nail down on you guys. You know, and they just not having your jersey tucked in or like, like I'm more mouth guard. I mean, I guess shouldn't probably doesn't say that, but like, <laughs> I'm more mouth guard since I played. Like, I've, that's crazy to me too. But like they always say, like you better have a mouth guard. And like I'll hear it again in a month. Like if you don't have a yeah. mouth guard, you're not playing. And I'll do you fuck up your teeth. And I'll. S- Put one into my my helmet for the month of August, and then once it comes around, just yank it out. And Jesus. That's crazy like, that's, to me. That's normal. Like I prom- I mean, not like that. Like I know, yeah. Like they're not out there in booty shorts, but like that 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 was the crazy. Like it's that yeah. you're not trying to hide it at all, and there's yeah. literally no- they definitely like, try to hide it like you t- during a yeah, game, hundred percent. But you take a hit with this fit on right now, you're done. You take a like a nice yeah. hit with this fit on right now, you have literally no protection on any part of your legs, and like. Not saying your legs just gonna snap, but like that's exactly how you get like a weird little Charlie horse, something that's gonna keep you out of a game for no, yeah. You know, I mean, it's risky enough. biz. Yeah, it's risky biz for sure. <laughs> Depends on who you got patrol in the middle of the field, I guess. Yeah, here's another one for you. I like these stripes. Yeah, they got a, they got a good way. setup. I like really like those stripes, I and I, I like how they didn't feel the need to go one in the middle and two on the sides. Like mm-hmm. it, it, it mirrors right the shoulder to the leg right there. The way that like 
matches up. I forgot up. what coach actually recruited me. I, I wonder if they're still there. I wonder if that coaching staff still there. You have to look. I don't know. It's not top of my head, top of my head but that uh, I like how it, like, not, not mirrors is not the right word, but, you know, it's like on the top and the bottom there is the same. It's really yeah, nice. No, yeah, so I like the, it. It's they're cool. the Fighting Bees? Yeah. It's kind of sick. They have a really nice campus. Yeah, there's a last one for you. It's in, I'm pretty sure it's in Iowa. It is. Yeah, but clean looks. Clean looks all around. Yeah. Big time moves. Sweet. Like Thanks, eight, eight five. Out of eight, 10. Wait, okay, wait. These are this is an eight five. I give these eight five. I probably go eight five. That's pretty high. Well, I mean, baby blue though. Like it's just so unique. Yeah. Like I don't think you can really like again. You can't really f up a baby blues. Yeah. Like I same think, with same with whites. Like I yeah. give I give UTPB right UTPB UTPB U- University that, of Texas at Permian Basin. Permian Basin. Yeah, yeah. Permian Basin. I'd give that like a seven two. Really. Like I like their unis, but like it, everything. I like, like the whites more than I like the other. Yeah, and everything like just blended together nice, which again is not, it's pretty hard to fuck up. It is, but <laughs> like I don't know seven two eight five. Heard it here first. Those are the rankings. One bite. Yeah. Thanks, Kate. Yep. All right. Thank you, Cade, for being on here, giving the uh, giving the rankings out of ten for those those two uniforms of those two respective squads. Now let's move over to Division Three here, the one level we didn't talk about with those uniforms. We've got a little bit of a scheduling agreement in Division Three, and uh, this one comes between the Liberty League and the Empire Eight. Not apparently, I guess, too surprising, but something that we're seeing a lot more of these conferences at, at all these small school levels, but Division Three in particular. Partnering up and securing some of those outer conference games for all their member institutions for following years. And this just makes a lot of sense. Not just this one in general, but the idea of it. Because you're taking the load off of your coaching staffs and your administration and all those other people that are involved with these decisions. At small schools, this out of schedule, con- or, uh, out of conference, excuse me, scheduling has become such another ordeal and a piece that's been thrown onto the plate of the administration and the uh, coaching staffs, respectively, at all these smaller schools. It's something that Division One squads have dealt with for decades, for borderline centuries, right? Trying to schedule out a conference, especially now in today's day and age, you've got Division One schools announcing future matchups maybe four or five years in advance because they're already inking those deals and it has all that has to do with media rights and contracts and those kind of things. But for small schools that maybe don't have that level of those staffers and that kind of, uh, you know, those resources scheduling those when money and travel is a much bigger part of the equation and a bigger factor in the decision-making process, it can be really tedious and difficult for a lot of these smaller schools at the D3 level. So you got the Empire 8, the Liberty League. They've announced a crossover footballing schedule agreement uh, for at the 2025 and 2026 seasons with potential of renewal in future seasons. So it seems like kind of a trial run. Hey, let's make sure this shit works. And then if it does, which we assume it will, We'll continue to pick this thing up. So, uh, it, kind of the the article here has a lot of like yap and a lot of uh, buzzwords, but you know when you when you look at this thing, some of the big takeaways: Empire Eight, obviously Cortland, a lot of the State University of New York schools um, there are in there. Brockport's another one. Morrisville, we've had uh, some representatives from here on there. Um, then you look over to you know the Liberty League. And the one that jumps out is obviously Ithaca College, right? So you've got that game that's being played uh, every year just about it with that Cortica Jug game. So that's something that I'm sure was a big part of this, which just makes sense because those two not being in the same conference but being and having that historic rivalry with the Cortica Jug game happening, uh, taking place every year, that's an easy kind of crossover there. But some other squads over in the Liberty League that are, uh, I think, worth noting. Uh, Hobart College. One that I think we've heard a decent amount about, uh, potentially uh, RPI is the one that we've seen a good, quite a bit of, Union College, those kind of things. Ithaca has won the last two outright Liberty League championships. We talked about that before. Um, but, you know, they had two playoffs teams last year in the Bombers and Union, and we know how hard it is to get an at-large bid into that uh, D3 football playoff. So big news for those two conferences. Excited to see what comes of that. And, again, it's just, it's just news, right? It's off-season news. It makes sense. Good. Better, better for the sport here. Let's move over. Talk about the man making the jump to NAIA uh, from NAIA to the Big Ten. We talked about Jalen Gramstad last week. This week, the announcement comes officially, and it actually comes from the official team account over there. The Red Raiders at Northwestern College put out a thank you. Jalen, for your contributions to Northwestern College and Red Raider football, we're looking forward to seeing you stand out in your future playing and coaching career. Very cool. 
class act from Northwestern here. Because, again, you talk about a guy who has been the face of this program for the re- in recent history in a program that has won a national championship, a program that has appeared in multiple national championships, and uh, a dude who's coming off of NAIA Player of the Year selection this past season. He has really done it all. He has a full and complete resume at Northwestern. And while we talked about it last week, he might not have the size and the measurables. The dude has the it factor. And I'm really hoping and and really excited to see what he does at this next level. And at the power four level is ridiculous. So really classy move from Northwestern here to put out their own little thank you note. Um, and you've got a quote from Coach McCarty as well, who we were lucky enough to have on the show as well. He says, quote, we're so excited for Jalen as the opportunity to pursue playing FBS Power 5 football. Mm. Coach, we're going to have to go back, switch that. It's a four. There we go. His growth and development through his Northwestern experience has been a privilege to be a part of. Our promise to each player is to invest in them when, when they are, excuse me, is to invest in them where they're at and prepare them for what's next. In this case, it happens to be playing football in the Big Ten. Pretty cool. And I think this is a statement that we're going to see a lot more from a lot of small school coaches. We talked about a little bit earlier. We mentioned JVR Suggs in the transfer portal, the big time defensive tackle out of Grand Valley State, who's going to play in the Bayou at LSU. And one of their athletic directors had tweeted about, you know, really excited for him. And there was some discourse online about, should you really be touting this as someone from a smaller school who is losing prospects, being poached potentially to larger institutions? Should that be something that you kind of hang your hat on at the end of the day? My opinion kind of goes back and forth, but for guys like JVR, for guys like Jalen Gramstad, who have proven a lot at the Division II and NAI levels respectively, who have both earned degrees from their respective institutions, I think that's the biggest piece right there. Because in a day and age where the transfer portal has changed and evolved the sport that we we believe we know so much, that graduation transfer, that grad transfer rule has been in place for quite some time. Now, that is not something that has been introduced in the last calendar year. So for me, when you get your four-year degree, you get your undergraduate degree from the institution that recruited you out of high school. Man, you put in three, four years at one of those schools. You've done, did the work. Like, you've been there. You've put in the time and effort, I assume, to that program. And obviously, Coach agrees with that in Gramstad's case here. And for me, I love it. I I love this mindset and this attitude from a head coach to be able to embrace that. Um, And I think it's also part of a recruiting game, too, right? You see a recruit sees this, and they say, hey, yeah, I'm not coming to Northwestern because I want to go play at Nebraska or because I want to go play in the Big Ten. But what he is going to see is that, hey, If I go here and I do earn myself that opportunity, say I hit a freakish growth spurt, or I go win an NAIA Player of the Year award, or I have these accolades and I earn myself that opportunity, I'm not going to be looked down upon by my coaching staff, by my teammates, by my peers, those kind of things. So in that case, I do think I actually I like that mindset, that attitude from coach. Um, And I can certainly appreciate it. It makes sense. It's not something that we would have expected maybe five years ago. You know, being proud of a guy for leaving your program. But when you put it in that that sense, it doesn't really make sense. So much sense, but it is what it is. So I told you it'd be a shorter episode tonight. It absolutely, absolutely is going to be. We're going to close it off about a team down in Florida, Division II squad, that didn't start playing games until 2016. Inner squad only all of 2015. So they did the classic. You bring in your your red shirt class, red shirt all of them, inner squad scrimmages, that's it. 2016, they play their first round of games. Go about 500. It didn't take them. More than one year after that, 2017, they played in the national championship game and lost to Texas A&M Commerce. The University of West Florida started playing in 2016. The next year, they play in the natty, and they lose in the natty in 2017. So you're like, man, that's that would have been a crazy story, but good luck getting back. Took them two years. 2019, they go and win the whole damn thing. And they had some really impressive foes uh, that they topped on the way to that. They were 13-2. and two. They actually opened up the year with a loss at Carson Newman, which is kind of a shocker. Their next loss during the regular season came to the number one team in the country at the time, Valdosta State, Gulf, uh, Gulf South Conference foe. At Valdosta State, they lost by five to the number one team in the country. They had get back, though, just three weeks later against Valdosta State. Once again in title down, down there in Georgia. And they beat them by three points. Go on to win uh, against number six, Lenore Ryan in the quarters. Number two, Ferris State in the semifinals. I remember watching that game. And and finally, number four is Mankato in the championship. 48-40. Absolute shootout. And 
if you remember the guy that was playing quarterback at the time, he didn't gra- I shouldn't say he didn't graduate. He didn't finish at West Florida. That's Austin Reed. He was at UVF before making the move over to Western Kentucky. The guy coaching him, the quarterback coach from 2017 to 2020, his name's Caleb Nobles. He's now the head coach down there for the Argos, the Argonauts. He's only the second head coach in team history behind uh, Sturbeck, I believe his, his name was. And he played quarterback for the Argos and came on, quarterback coach, and then joined the staff at Clemson after the 2020 season. He was the Office of Player Development in that kind of role for Clemson. He comes back to be the head coach of the Argos. He's got these guys picking up right where they left off. Uh, He's done some fantastic work over there. He is an elite play caller. Like I said, Coach Austin Reed has coached multiple big-time quarterbacks. Talk about Pee Wee Jarrett here is another name off the list, and he's got a couple more guys coming through that program that should be uh, pretty exciting to watch. His wife, Katie's UVF volleyball alum. He's got some really deep ties. But back to... uh, you know, the team kind of more in general, 64-25 and 25 all-time record right now for the Argonauts down there in Pensacola, Florida. That is impressive. Their stadium is the Penn Air Stadium down once again in Pensacola, Florida. Here is the flyover, what we got going on down there for the Argos. Pretty nice setup. Like I said, this team has not been around for very long. It's a really new facility. They just got brand new AstroTurf, turf, excuse me, I believe in 2023. So this field is fresh. Got a nice little stands right there. Again, the stadium is nothing flashy. The location is great. And there are plans moving forward to continue to renovate this thing because everyone knows when you win big-time college football games and you do it consistently, especially at the high level that uh, UVF, UWF excuse me, is doing right now, your facilities are only going to get better and better. So I think this is just really the start uh, for not only this field, but this team and kind of this program, which is really exciting. It seats about 4,000 people. There's uh, sounds like more than 2,000 more seats for standing room. And I believe there have been multiple occasions where they utilize most of that. Here's one of them. Here's a great drone shot of the stadium, and then they get some pretty sunsets down there in uh, in Pensacola, so that's a pretty sweet shot. But they got a lot going on down there. Uh, they've got... I, I, I'm a food guy, so I don't know why when I find these information, I think it's hilarious. They got barbecue, they got Greek catering food, they got a food court behind the bleachers. I'm always a fan of like kind of the football building right behind the end zone right there. Um, that hill with all the people is electric. And uh, sometimes it sounds like Penn Air, the credit union who is the title sponsor of this facility, it sounds like they're giving out free food at some of these games, so... Uh, that's pretty awesome, but uh, pretty sweet facilities down there for the Argos. They got some. They got some really good things uh, going on now. As far as this last year, they had two guys earn NFL shots after the 2023 season. Both of them were first team. Uh, no, not sorry, not first team All Americans. But this man was a first team All American. That's John Giles, the wide receiver from the Argonauts. You can see in the little edit here, he is actually signed a UDFA deal with the New York Giants. The dude. Uh, I think a lot of people talked about, obviously, a freak athlete. Um, you have to be to get to that level. But the catch radius on him was something that I think was kind of a selling point. The quick twitch speed, obviously, the full. He, he has like a, he's a total, I don't know, like a, the five-tool equivalent, right? Like I think in baseball, like a five-tool player. He runs the whole route tree. He does a lot of things very well, can beat you with speed. Um, but I think the catch radius and kind of that freak athleticism was what at least got his foot in the door. And obviously, he's made the most of it, earning himself a deal with the Giants. The other guy who we, once again, have had the pleasure to uh, have on the show here is Pee Wee Jarrett, a.k.a. Byron. But hearing himself a minicamp invite to the New York Jets, the former signal caller for the Argos. Now, his stint with the Jets was short. I believe they had some concerns about previous maybe shoulder injuries or something of the sort. But talk about a dude who, coming from the junior college, community college level, came and just lit up the scene at West Florida. Very prototypical NFL build. The dude is Built. He's got a rocket of an arm, and he's had some great help. Don't get me wrong. You talk about Giles as a dude on the outside that's done a lot of great things. The year prior, David Durden, the, I believe, I hopefully got that one right, but he's the receiver that went from West Florida last year and I believe is still potentially with the Cowboys. Or I know he landed with the Cowboys originally, but they've put out some NFL quality caliber talent here very recently. And Austin Reed, I think you can throw right on that list as far as quarterbacks go, because he was uh, UWF made, man, even though he was obviously burst onto the scene at Western Kentucky with the Hilltoppers. But alas, 2024, this season for the Argonauts down there in West Florida, they got exciting season coming up. Let's take a look at their, their schedule here. And what makes the schedule a little bit interesting, I mean, Grand Valley State jumps off the schedule here at first, because that is awesome. 
What kind of makes this interesting, not just for them, but for all the Gulf South teams, is that West Georgia officially made that jump up to D1. Now, excuse me. I'm totally blanking on what conference they joined. But West Georgia did used to be in the Gulf South Conference very like, as of totally recently. Um, but they've made that a jump officially to Division One, So that's opened up some more out-of-conference scheduling opportunities for teams uh, in the Gulf South. And you'll see here, they've got two out-of-conference in the first three weeks. They open up against McKendree, which will be a solid test for them at home. The homestand continues with West Alabama, who will be another great test. And then you go at Grand Valley State, who is slated right now as one of the top you know, five to eight teams in the country right now, they could easily be top three depending on who you ask, right? And that would be me. I, I certainly think they've earned that right in Super Region 3 and, and being one of those teams that, hey, you want to prove it, you're going to play the Lakers. And I think that's exactly what Coach Noble and the uh, Argonauts are thinking right now that, hey, we got a game early on that we're going to show everyone exactly what we're about. We got treated to do an absolute game last year, Grand Valley and Colorado Mines. I'm hoping this one in week three is just going to be just as spectacular. Then you get into some more Gulf South play here, Mississippi College. Delta State will be a huge one. Now they are missing some pieces. Patrick Gigog, the player of the year there in uh, in that state, uh, regardless of level, they lose him, who was a Harlan Hill candidate last year, a nominee, I should say. That will still be an incredible game. Showing Shorter, Erskine, North Greenville. This stretch right here probably doesn't jump out at you, but in this conference, you never really know. And then you close out the year at Valdosta State. That game could have a lot of implications when it comes to the Gulf South, when it comes to that super region, when it comes to the playoff scheme and structure as a whole, because there's a great chance that one or both of these teams will have one loss at this point of the year. So now you talk about in this very fragile Division II playoff picture, it, which is limited geographically, obviously, you're talking about two teams that if you have two losses could be one of the first snubs out of the playoffs. So, again, not looking too far ahead. There's a lot of ball to be played between now and then if you're the Argos or if you're the Blazers down there, respectively, at Valdosta. But I'm eyeing that one. One, potentially, is a Gulf South championship game. The fact that it's the last week of the regular season for them is epic. And also because the playoff implications are going to be huge. But... That's kind of it for West Florida. That's the cliff notes. That's what you need to know about the Argonauts. Let me know what team you guys want to hear about next. That's it for this episode, man. It's going to be a short one, short and sweet. For D1R, I've been Kobe Manzo.